um, today's talk, so my name is Javier Shloman, as he said, um, and a lot of this talk it comes out of my dissertation defense. It's kind of a portion of it. The research that I performed with Dr. Buer and Dr. Dillon, I'm tempted to walk over there, but I've been told I need to stay in these confines over here. Uh, and the title of the talk is Attractively Characterizing Hearability and Geometry, and the focus is on cellular network positioning. So don't worry too much yet if you don't understand these terms. I will define hearability and geometry. And the key to this work is this: the first word, which is the attractively, uh, which is really where the contribution lies. So I guess before I begin, I don't want to assume too much. What do I mean by positioning? So by positioning, I mean determining the location of a mobile device. And since we are all here at Wireless at Virginia Tech, we're discussing determining this location using wireless signals. So the first question you might have is, well, you know, why do I care? Why study positioning? And positioning has many important applications. Uh, let me first draw you to wireless sensor networks and mobile ad hoc networks. So these are networks which are often characterized by large numbers of devices. They are characterized by deployments, which are typically not rigid. So you, you don't, you know, the, the locations of the devices is uh, much more random and not really known ahead of time. And these, these networks usually do some sort of self-organization. And as part of that self-organization, they need to determine their location. So why is that important? Well, consider a wireless sensor network. You have a sensor out in the field somewhere, and it's giving you a certain reading. That reading is useless to you unless you know where that reading was made. So it adds meaning to sensor measurements. In mobile ad hoc networks, it can be used for the intelligent routing of packets. And that's what I'm trying to depict. Uh, oh, I guess it's only on one side. With that, um, with that figure, consider that as these devices determine their locations, then a certain subset of devices could be selected, uh, which are centrally located, to be the points, the forwarding points, to forward information throughout the network. In cellular networks, uh, I imagine that the majority of us have uh, smartphones. You're probably well aware that a lot of apps really require location information to provide you their services. Um, but in addition, you, if you were ever stranded somewhere uh, away from home, uh, you don't know where you are and you're calling 911, um, the, if the cellular network is able to determine your location, you'll be very grateful for that because that can provide potentially life-saving information to the operator who can then hand it off to, you know, for, for example, a rescue squad. And lastly, it's an enabling technology for autonomous vehicles. Uh, I think I said this at my dissertation defense, but personally, I would not like cars out on the roads driving next to me and my family if those cars you know, don't have a driver and don't know really well where they are. So let me just propose to you a seemingly simple solution to the whole positioning problem. And let's look up to the skies. Specifically, let's look at global navigation satellite systems, which are satellite-based satellite localization systems they are prevalent and widely accessible, and a well-known example that uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with is the global positioning system, the GPS, uh, which can be used anywhere in the world uh, outside and in clear skies. So let's just put a GNSS chip on every single device that I mentioned in the networks on the previous slide, and, and we're done, and, and you guys cannot go eat snacks, <laughs> I guess if they're still doing that. So, is the positioning problem solved? No, it, I submit that it's not. Obviously, I don't think if I had ended my talk at slide three, they would have awarded me my degree. So, the thing is, global navigation satellite systems are not quite enough. Uh, for wireless sensor networks and mobile ad hoc networks, besides what I said that there's often a large number of devices, these devices are often very small, they try to build them very cheaply, and they're often very energy constrained, battery constrained, for example. And you can't really equip all devices with GNSS receivers. Instead, it's more likely that a subset of devices will know their location using something like satellite-based location system. And then the remaining devices will determine their locations um, using what's called a network localization technique. For cellular devices, there's good news, and that's all new cellular devices are equipped with GNSS receivers. However, there's a bad news to that, and I mean, I would ask you, do you make all of your phone calls outdoors? 
Uh, I am sure the answer is no. In fact, the FCC has recognized this. Let me read a quote that, from the FCC, which states that the great majority of calls to 911 now originate on wireless phones, and the majority of wireless calls now originate indoors. And then the FCC said that these changes elevate the importance of ensuring that indoor 911 calls can be accurately located. So, bad news is that GNSS is unreliable indoors and in urban canyons, so even though all new devices have these receivers, um, since so many calls are made indoors, GNSS can't be used, so we need some other technique. Worst news is that the FCC, after making this quote, has approved a phase-in of new indoor E911 requirements. So the E911 mandate is a mandate here in the United States by the Federal Communications Commission, which essentially specifies, uh, specifies accuracy requirements which cellular network operators must meet in order to locate a mobile phone. And the motivation behind that is kind of that, E9, uh, that 911 example that I gave you. So hopefully by now you understand that uh, you know what positioning is, that it's an interesting uh, research topic and something we need to look at, and that the problem isn't solved, and we, we still need to continue looking at it. And in particular, for the cellular example, uh, when the GPS system, for example, is unreliable, we're going to turn to network localization, specifically using the cellular base stations. And that's what we're talking about in this talk. So now, what are some key factors that determine positioning performance? And this is going to be kind of the, uh, the figures that I use throughout the talk. But let this black square represent a mobile device who doesn't know its location. And then this mobile device is located somewhere, and base stations, uh, the base stations that surround it uh, are denoted in this picture using the red circles. So independent of the algorithm that you use for positioning, there are several fundamental factors which affect positioning performance. And that is the number of devices that participate. So in this case, uh, you know, there is no guarantee that all those devices I put on in that picture can participate. There are reasons why they can't, for example, interference and shadowing, things like that. So in this figure, there are four base stations that can participate in positioning. Uh, another factor which is important is where those base stations are, the locations of those base stations, which is captured by that term geometry. So the first thing the number of devices is what, if you tie this back to the title of the talk, is the hearability aspect. The locations of the participating devices is the geometry aspect. And then lastly, there's obviously a factor due to the quality of the positioning observations. And, that, and by that I mean, if you consider this scenario, and let's say the base stations are performing some sort of ranging to the mobile device, are those range estimates typically within one meter of the true range, or are they typically within 20 meters of the true range? That's going to have a very significant impact on the essential eventual accuracy of locating that mobile device. And as might be intuitive, as the mobile device moves out, moves throughout the network, these factors are constantly changing. And any specific point, the factors will be a function of the following realizations. The locations of the base stations around it, and then channel effects, such as shadowing, and then network effects, such as which devices are active or inactive. This uh, particularly could affect the interference field. So let's look at the literature and what are some typical ways that performance is currently evaluated. If an analytical result is desired, then researchers turn to the Cromera lower bound. So this is a topic uh, from estimation theory, a tool from estimation theory, which provides an analytical result, an analytical lower bound on the mean square error of an unbiased estimate. So the thing about the Cromera lower bound is that we can calculate it when we fix the positioning scenario. So those factors that I mentioned on the previous slides, if we fix the number of devices, the location of the devices, and then we have some model for the accuracy of the positioning observation, we can calculate the Cromera lower bound for a particular scenario. However, the result I get for this scenario doesn't give me much insight when I change those fundamental factors. So in this case, I have a different number of devices participating, a different geometry, and very likely uh, the accuracy of the observations is going to be different. So when you want results instead that 
don't require you to fix the positioning scenario, but instead you want results that are averaged over kind of all scenarios that a mobile device could encounter throughout the cellular network, uh, the research turns to simulation. And so simulation is very useful because you can simulate a bunch of different scenarios and then aggregate those and present the results. Um, but the thing about simulation is, I mean, sometimes simulations can be very complicated to even put together. They're prone to bugs. But let's say you have all those things worked out. It's not always intuitive to draw out trends or understand how different network parameters affect positioning performance. So if I want to change the network parameters such as uh, how many base stations there are per unit area. So this is called the density. I think, you know, typically if I have a simulation-based result for a particular density, if I want to change the density, I go into my simulation, I change it, and I rerun the whole simulation. So what will we talk about today? How did, you know, how did I contribute in this first part of my dissertation? Uh, I'm going to present a new model which lets us tractably analyze localization fundamentals. And um, this is kind of uh, complementary to these two previous approaches. It doesn't replace them, but it kind of takes the best of both worlds in that, in the end, the model allows us to get an analytical result which is naturally averaged over all of the positioning scenarios that might be encountered. And then we'll use this model for these two analyses that I mentioned, which is hearability, the number of participating devices, and then also to come up with a metric to characterize base station geometries. And in this talk, I'll focus on cellular networks uh, specifically. And uh, if you're interested, these works are actually on archive. Uh, they are not yet published. Uh, we just heard back from the paper which presents one and two uh, and just had minor revisions, actually really minor revisions. So you should be able to find that really soon. Uh, obviously, I'm excited about that. I hope he's excited about it. <laughs> And, uh, and then this other work you can find on archive, it actually just came back. Uh, it, w it, went, it was a shorter work to the letters. It got rejected, but it doesn't look too bad to make some revisions and resubmit. So hopefully that will be out there sometime soon as well. At least I'm, hope I I'm confident that it will be. Do you care? Yes, I care. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, so let's, let me first get on with the, the proposed model. So we have uh, the mobile device, again, just as before, um, is represented by this black square, and we've placed this device at the origin without any sort of loss of generality, and surround the device with... Uh, base stations which are deployed randomly according to a Poisson point process. And so what does that mean? That means they are deployed in a uniformly random manner and in our work in the R2 plane. This is actually a well accepted model that's been used for almost 20 years for cellular networks. It was first introduced in 1997 by Bicelli. And, um, and it's actually becoming increasingly mo more realistic because today's wireless networks are kind of deviating from that centrally planned uh, macro cell structure to include more kind of small cell extensions like pico cells and femto cells which are placed more opportunistically. Uh, the big thing about using this type of deployment model is that it allows us now to bring in tools from an area of mathematics called stochastic geometry and that's where kind of the analytical tractability comes in. You might notice that some base stations are solid, some are hollow. This is just to represent that some may be active and inactive at, at a certain point in time. And we model the probability that these nodes are active or inactive using two activity factors, uh, P and Q. So now let's look at the positioning uh, problem specifically. So this mobile device doesn't know where it is, but it wants to calculate its location and use the L uh, L base stations in order to determine his location. So how would those L base stations be selected? Well, typically, we would use essentially what's called the strongest base station association policy. Essentially, the L strongest base stations are selected according to average received power. If there's no shadowing present, then this is uh, going to be the L closest base stations. When shadowing is present, we have no guarantee of that. One other nice thing about our model is that shadowing is when we're looking at received signal strength based metrics, 
Shadowing can be easily incorporated via transformation of the density. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but you, know, you can ask if you have a question. Uh, and the received signal strength based metric, or the signal strength based metric that we are looking at, uh, because cellular networks are interference limited, so interference is something that we don't want to ignore, is the signal to interference plus noise ratio, the SINR. So let's look at the SINR for a specific base station. Let's look at, okay, what's the SINR of the positioning signal coming from this KF base station? And it's going to be in the numerator, the transmitted power times some sort of path loss due, due to just the propagation distance of the signal. And then in the denominator, we have the interference and noise. There's going to be the interference from other base stations which are participating in localization plus interference from the rest of the network and then a thermal noise component at the receiver. One thing you might notice is that this SINR expression, which is different in, from communication models, does not include a small-scale fading term. And so this agrees with state-of-the-art localization models, and it's a key difference between our work and work that's out there uh, for communications, for example, coverage analyses um, for communication purposes. And the reason there's no small-scale fading term is because, um, because you're trying to get, uh, de essentially detect signals from faraway base stations, which are coming in at very low uh, SINRs, um, or very low signal strengths. Localization systems typically have to have significant processing gain, and one way that's achieved is by integrating over a longer period of time, which then averages out these small fluctuations. Again, and this is the model used by 3GPP, who I'll probably allude to maybe a couple more times, but 3GPP is the standardization body for LTE, which as we all know is pretty much the cellular standard going forward. All right, so just to kind of summarize um, how this model is general, it allows us to arrive at uh, expressions in terms of many uh, network design parameters. These include the density of the base station deployments, the average network load, the uh, certain coordination among base stations, processing gain, receiver sensitivity. So receiver sensitivity is you know, down to what SINR can the mobile device still detect a localization signal. And then also um, propagation conditions such as the path loss exponent and shadowing strength. So rather than fixing these, these will be in the end results. And so you can very easily see their impact. Or, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say easily, depending on the result, right? You can um, vary these at the, at the very least very easily and see the impact of that on localization. All right, so now let's move on to the hearability study. And you don't, you don't actually need to read this, um, but as I mentioned earlier, the number of devices that can participate at any point in time is random. And we're going to capture that using this random variable, epsilon, and it's essentially the number of base station signals that arrive above a certain detection threshold. And what we're interested in is calculating this random variable, epsilon, specifically, what is the probability that the mobile device can use L or more base stations for localization? So that's, that's what we're looking at here. And we call that the L localizability probability. So in order to determine whether L base stations can, I mean, to, to, I guess I should go back, uh, take one step back. In, if L or more base stations can participate in localization, then the Lth weakest, that's equivalent to saying that the Lth weakest incoming signal is above the detection threshold. I mean, the L plus one might be, but, but we don't care. We just want L or more. So we can simply look at the weakest of the closest L base stations. And remember, closest because we've done the shadowing transformation. And so characterizing the L localizability probability is now uh, essentially a problem of looking at the SINR from the Lth base station and making sure that that is above the detection threshold. Um, now, at the moment, there is no known, you know, well-known approach for handling, characterizing the distribution of this SINR. 
That's, that's, and that's due, this complication is due to the fact that we don't have this small scale fading time. In communication systems, there are, you know, I'm not saying for this specific example, but there are well known tools for handling the distribution of SINR when uh, a random variable from the exponential family of distributions is incorporated into the SINR. But we don't have that. So in our work, we present a dominant interferer approach, which worked out you know, really nicely. So what, what do we mean, you know, why is it called a dominant interferer? So what we're going to look at is the SINR from the LH base station by considering the location of the LH base station exactly, which is denoted here. Uh, this is the LH base station and the distance to the mobile device is R sub L. This is a random variable and we know the distribution of that random variable. Now, we need to understand though, conditioned on the LH base station being at a certain distance, how are the L minus one closest base stations? Well, actually, I guess I, I will jump to that on the next slide. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, but what, what, what else we're going to do is we're going to consider the closest active base station. So this is the strongest interferer um, exactly. And for the remaining interference terms, so the interference in this annular region and the interference in, in the rest of the network, we are going to essentially calculate the conditional mean. So here, the mean will be conditioned on the location of the LF base station, the closest active base station, and then just the number of active base stations. Uh, for the rest of the network, we're going to take the conditional mean of the interference, and this will be conditioned. It only needs to be conditioned on the location of the LF base station. So that's the, any questions about that dominant interfere, like why it's called that? I think, I hope it was kind of clear. And so the goal of the work is to characterize, now we've revised the SINR expression uh, to the following. And I guess I should have pointed here when I, when I described the conditional mean because we wouldn't clearly see what we're conditioning on. So the goal is to characterize that SINR expression. So what are some of the steps of the analysis? This is where I was getting ahead of myself. First, we condition on the location of the LF base station, and then we need to understand the L minus 1 closer base stations. The, how are they uh, distributed, deployed, once we do this conditioning? And it turns out uh, we presented a lemma that showed that these L minus, base, L minus 1 base stations are distributed according to a binomial point process, which means simply that it's a fixed number of base stations uniformly distributed in a fixed region. Uh, then once we determined that, that was lemma one, we were able, to, we show, we essentially characterized the location of the closest, we needed to characterize the location of the closest active base station, the dominant interfere within that BPP. And then once again, condition now on the location of the Ellis base station and the closest active base station, which here is uh, R sub one half. Half means it's the, you know, if it's one, it's the closest active. That's essentially the notation, but I don't think it, it's too important uh, here. Uh, and then, so now we have an understanding of where all of these base stations are. We can proceed with, we know how base stations within this annular region are deployed. We obviously knew how the base stations in the remainder of the network are deployed. We can then proceed to determine the expressions now for the conditional means in that SINR, in the denominator of the SINR. And so we do that in two lemmas and then have to handle a special case um, of no active interferes. And the reason that has to be handled separately is because uh, this R sub 1 term, I guess it is important, doesn't, <laughs> uh, doesn't exist if there is no closest active interfere. Uh, and then lastly, we characterize that overall SINR from the LF base station by deconditioning on everything that we've conditioned on which is what you can see right there, but taking the three expectations. And that leads to a main result, uh, which is theorem two in, in the paper you can find on archive at the moment. Okay, so one thing I wanted to do, and you know, I thought maybe I had more time, I could do something more complicated, but I actually I don't think I do. Um, I just want to give one example to show where stochastic geometry helped with attractability to kind of motivate that, yeah, it, it's a worthwhile thing to look at. So remember that 
Okay, so the I2 term represents the interference from all of the base stations uh, beyond those that are participating in localization. So beyond the LF base station. And those are active or inactive with some probability Q, which is independent among the different base stations. And so we can then consider a new Poisson point process, which represents just the active nodes, because those are the ones that are adding to the interference, by thinning, by, con by considering a new thinned Poisson point process, which is thinned with, a, it has a new density of Q, which is less than one, Q and lambda, which was the original, uh, is the density of the base stations. So now we arrive at a new Poisson point process, and we go from there. So what we're trying to show is, or what we're trying to get a, an analytical result for, and hopefully a fairly easy, simple one, is what's the expected value of the interference from this region, essentially the far field, given the location of the LF base station. You can't go. <laughs> right, so what we are looking at is essentially an infinite sum. This is an infinite sum now of all of the over all of the base stations in this far field. And I don't know about you, but if, if I'm looking at this and considering that um, there's just many random factors, this is typically intractable if you're going to consider, for example, a mobile device randomly placed in an hexagonal grid. It's very difficult. It's even very difficult if you just limit the number of uh, interfering base stations in the far field. However, by turning the stochastic geometry using the model that we have, we can handle this quite easily. So this expected value of an infinite sum, there's a tool in stochastic geometry called Campbell's theorem, which can be used exactly to handle this, and allows us to turn uh, this ex expectation into a fairly simple integral expression. And by applying Campbell's theorem, we can, we have our Lambda down here is actually Q lambda, since that's the PP3 we're working with. We can convert this expectation into that expression, which is an integral over essentially all of the points in the far field, which is what's represented uh, down here. That's the support of that integral. And we can convert that to polar coordinates and do a little bit of math and arrive at this infinite summation and this expected value, that infinite summation, turns into this really nice expression that's very easy to handle. And so that's just one example. So this is the simplest example from the work where you could see where the model that we use that allows us to bring in tools from stochastic geometry allows us to make, take some complicated expressions and arrive at fairly simple, tractable results. So some key results that arose from this analysis, uh, we were able to derive a closed form bound on the probability of uh, L localizability. And uh, this was one particularly nice expression that arose when we considered essentially a fully active network, fully loaded network. Uh, we were able to arrive at a general double integral expression so this is completely general. In terms of all these network parameters, uh, it, it, one that you could calculate at MATLAB instantly, double integral expression for the probability of L localizability. And um, while you know, that may not mean much, you might still not like the fact that it's double integral. The only other result that we are aware of along these lines uh, has, for fixed L, I think requires something like two L integrals over all sorts of hypergeometric functions. Uh, I took their code that they put up online and tried to run it, and I just quit after many hours. I, it would not even give me one result for one SI and LI value. Uh, and whereas here, we're getting instant results, and uh, we'll see that the, we're obviously using an approximation, but it's accurate. We're able to take that, if you didn't like double integrals and you're happy with single integrals, <laughs> we made a further approximation which will let you have a general single integral expression, which is actually really accurate in the region, really, that most localization people are going to care about. And I can explain that on the next slide. 
uh, for in cellular networks, typically in 3GPP, fully loaded networks are always considered, and path loss exponent of 3.76 is used. If we consider a fully loaded network and a path loss exponent of 4, which is somewhat close to 3.76, we are able to convert this general double integral expression into a single integral expression without using this additional approximation. And this is a really useful result because the cellular scenario is one that we really care about. And then lastly, again, cellular networks often include, or um, pretty much always include, some sort of protocol for frequency reuse, at least for positioning. And so we extended our results um, by considering multiple independent Poisson point processes uh, to include frequency reuse factors other than universal frequency reuse. So just to look at some numerical results from this analysis. Okay, so on the x-axis, we have essentially the detection threshold. This is an SINR and dBs. Uh, the y-axis is the probability of being able to use L base stations for localization. The results here are for L equals to 4. And this is particularly um, interesting value for those in uh, looking at cellular localization because cellular localization is very, very commonly performed using time difference of arrival based positioning and to guarantee an unambiguous, unique uh, position fix using TDOA, you need four base stations. And so essentially you could consider this the coverage probability of TDOA positioning in cellular networks. So that's why I think throughout this talk we'll look at L equals 4 because it has special significance. So on this figure to the left, what I'm trying to show is two things. One, there I plot with the solid line the true L localizability, which is arrived at using simulations. And then the dash curve is what our analytical result gave us. And you can see that they are you know, except for alpha equals three, there's a tiny little deviation, and that's even um, hardly, it's almost imperceptible. Our approximations are very accurate across even different path loss exponents. Another thing you might notice, though, is let's say you want, let's say in a cellular network, you really need to locate a mobile device. If you have any hope of meeting FCC requirements, uh, at least 95% of the time, a mobile device should have at least four base stations. So if we look at that particular scenario, uh, L localizability of 95% for the curve, which is closest to the cellular example, alpha equals 4, you would arrive at, OK, the mobile device needs to have a sensitivity of about negative 35 dB. And that's, um, that's really prohibitively low. I mean, to get processing gain even to, you know, could make up some of that. but at that point, uh, you, you cannot do positioning in this scenario using universal frequency reuse. And so that's why cellular networks incorporate frequency reuse for positioning. And that's what the figure on the right shows. So again, the x and the y axes are the same, but the curves now represent solid uh, uh, truth and our approximation for different frequency reuse factors. From the left, we have universal frequency reuse, so this is going to match the alpha equals 4 curve over here. Uh, frequency reuse factor of 2, 3, and 6. And in uh, 3 GPP, they often consider detection thresholds before any processing gain from about minus 6 dB to about minus 10, sometimes minus 13 and minus 14, in that range. And the only frequency reuse factor that s suffices to give a really reliable positioning performance for cellular networks is this curve, which, which is a frequency reuse of 6. And this is important because, I mean, these are the results of our analysis, but also if you go into uh, and start reading on 3GPP, the uh, frequency reuse of factor of 6 is what? In the end, after many rounds and many months of simulations, what uh, 3GPP decided on was necessary for LTE. So we're getting the same result using our analysis. And um, 
without the need to run uh, complex simulations. All right, so now let's move on to the second part of the talk. Remember that the fundamental factors that determine positioning performance are the number of devices, again, the geometry, and then the quality. So we've looked at the number of devices, but that doesn't tell the whole story. For example, somebody in localization would look at this and would say, you know, it's typically nice to have base stations surround the mobile device. That's typically good for localization performance. So in this case, we have four participating devices. And then if I show this figure to a localization researcher, very likely they would look at that and say, you know, I don't expect that good of localization performance. This is what's typically considered a good geometry, and this is a poor geometry, for example, for TDOA position. So the number of participating devices only tells part of the story. because so obviously we have the same number of both of these figures and localization performance. I certainly don't expect it to be uh, the same by any means. Well, one well-known metric for characterizing geometry that's out there is the geometric dilution of precision, or the GDOP. One nice thing about the GDOP is it's actually derived similar, very similarly to the CRLB. And if the quality of the positioning observations, uh, for example, let's say the positioning observations exhibited some sort of Gaussian error with some variance sigma squared shared by all observations, the GDOP can be mapped to the CRLB directly using this uh, transformation. So obviously the GDOP is a very insightful for eventual uh, positioning performance. One thing to notice is that you know, th this expression also tells us that geometry really can magnify the errors in positioning observations. So that's, this is the, uh, this is the uh, quality of the observations, and this is a ge geometric component. You see it's multiplicative. So it can really magnify any errors present in positioning observations if you have poor geometries. The thing about the GDOP is it's calculated very similarly to the Cromera lower bound, and because of that, it also requires fixing the positioning scenario, which means that we can't really uh, look at the GDOP, for example, characterize the GDOP across all the range of all positioning scenarios that might be encountered. So we set out to look at, okay, well, what would be another metric that can be tractable using our model that can give us insight into, uh, at least relative insight into the geometries of different you know, positioning scenarios. And the metric that we uh, proposed is using the maximum angular separation between base stations. So let me define that here. So let's just, let's just consider this common baseline. And in this case, there are four base stations that can participate in localization. And if we, uh, you know, in the first base station it, from this baseline is located at an angle theta 1, then we have theta 2, theta 3, and theta 4. And then we can calculate this angle 1, angle 2, angle 3, angle 4 to be, if we were to order these base stations, the increasing angle, what is the separation between any two successive base stations? And what we want to look at is what's the, ma the max of angle 1, angle 2, angle 3, angle 4, which in this case would be angle three. Can we use that? Does that give us any insight? And is that actually something that we can tractably characterize, like the distribution of that metric in terms of network parameters? Because we can't do that for the GDOP. So the first thing to look at, since the GDOP is a well-known indicator of you know, how good a certain geometry is, and it's clearly tied to positioning performance, we want to look at this metric and compare it to the GDOP. In this case, we're looking at TDOA positioning. And one thing we noticed that, that and we didn't expect it, there's not, a, there's not a great linear correlation between the metric and the GDOP. However, there is a significantly high rank correlation, which tells us two things. One, that this metric uh, is, well, at least we would expect this metric to be fairly useful for comparing two different scenarios. But then also that there is a monotonic function that can reasonably well transform uh, or provide at least a reasonable initial transformation between the maximum angular separation and the GDOP. And just 
trying something for fun with Daniel, we figured out that this <laughs> maximum angle and the log of the t-dot, actually, that's a good initial starting point for this transformation. So obviously, it's not directly tied to positioning performance, but there is a clear correlation between the metric and the g-dot. The thing about this metric is that it can be characterized in terms of network parameters and then give us insights into how different network parameters affect um, the geometries that might be encountered. Uh, and this right here is for is a result that we found. It was kind of a really neat little uh, following down this rabbit hole of all kinds of work that was done back in the early 90s. There is a known for this was of interest in a totally different field um, of mathematics. But the important thing is in 1939, the distribution of our metric was presented for a fixed L, in this, at least for what we call L, the number of base stations. And um, th this expression right here is taken from this paper in 1939. And then when we, com can, com we can combine this result with our previous analysis on hearability to essentially decondition on Upsilon, the number of base stations participating in localization. And characterize our metric in terms of network parameters. And one thing you might notice is that this sum, this is an infinite sum. So you'd say, well, it's really nice, but it's an infinite sum. I'll never finish. Um, and the thing is, it is an infinite sum. However, it really, from, from the scenarios that I've looked at, you don't ever really need to sum up more than 10, 15, or 20 different values of L because the probability that L, exactly L base stations are able to participate in localization, especially in these interference limited networks, goes down very, very quickly. So this second term goes to zero very, very quickly. And you get very accurate results by only summing over, you know, for example, 20 different values of L. So now we can look at a couple different things. For example, what's the impact of receiver sensitivity on this metric. And one thing that I thought was interesting was that significantly changing the sensitivity of the mobile device did not actually have a great impact on uh, the geometry, at least not as measured using our metric. So, you know, in this case, what we have is a cumulative distribution function. Our metric goes from 0 to 2 pi. And then obviously, we have 0 to 1 on the left. Uh, as the mobile device sensitivity is increased from negative 6 to minus 14 dB, which is that range that 3GPP considers. Uh, we see that there's actually not that significant of a change, at least not compared to, for example, decreasing the network load, which had a much more significant impact on the geometries that were encountered uh, in this in cellular networks. And so we have a similar figure, again, a cumulative distribution function. Uh, and you could consider decreasing the network load, something that's going from you know, the middle of the day, the peak part of the day to nighttime. And we see that the geometries significantly improve uh, as the network load is decreased, which, I mean, we would expect that. One thing that is really nice about this metric, and I think this might have been part of the motivation of really why we, why we looked at it, and I hadn't touched on this yet, is you might notice that I have a, a dashed line here at pi. This metric instantly gives us the probability that the mobile device is inside the convex hull of the base stations. And so by that I mean, let's say you have a mobile device and base stations participating in localization, and you have this giant rubber band, and you put it all the way around the base station and let go, and let it contract. If the mobile device is inside that rubber band, it's called being inside the convex hull, being outside the rubber band, outside the convex hull. And the probability that uh, this maximum angular separation, if, if it's less than pi, then you are inside the convex hull. If it's greater than pi, then the mobile device is outside the convex hull. So if you evaluate it at exactly pi, you can see the probability of being inside the convex hull. 
And one thing you see here, as the network load decreases from fully loaded network to about 10% load, uh, the mobile device is inside the convex hole about 50% of the time, and then goes all the way up to 95% of the time. Well, why, you know, why is this important? It's important because being inside and outside the convex hole is actually a really uh, good indicator of eventual positioning performance. And I show that uh, using this figure where I essentially plot the cumulative distribution function of the geometric dilution of precision. So again, not our metric, but this is the geometric dilution of precision, which is well known and well accepted as an indicator of position of uh, geometry and positioning, and can be directly tied to positioning performance. And again, the probability of uh, the CDF, that the abscissa is less. Uh, and so, or that the GDOP is less than the abscissa. What we see here is for when positioning is possible, so we're looking at L values greater than or equal to 4, TDOA positioning. If the mobile device is inside the convex hole, the geometric dilution of precision is pretty much upper bounded by 3, whereas it's unbounded if you're outside the convex hole. The other thing to note is that the best case performance is significantly lower when the mobile device is inside the convex hole. Oh, I'm on this thing. <laughs> good. So that's why, that's why this, is, this is important. And so there we go. Perfect. All right, so some conclusions of, you know, what did we show, at least in this first part of the dissertation, which considered non-collaborative positioning. Uh, we show that there is an alternate approach to what's out there for evaluating localization performance. And the results are analytical, but actually also naturally averaged over all the positioning scenarios that might be encountered. So we kind of present this to the localization community. And we encompass it into, in this new model that I presented today. And then we used the model and showed and performed some fundamental analyses on uh, hearability. And then also you know, presented this new metric that can get, give us some insight into the geometries that might be encountered in cellular networks. And one of the really nice things, again, is that it provides that probability of being inside the convex hole, which throughout the localization community is definitely well known to be a good indicator of eventual performance. And just as a last note, we've, we've really received a lot of interest and a lot of positive feedback uh, from this work. Hopefully, you'll be able to go out and find it on IEEE Explore soon. And um, I'm definitely hopeful that the model will lend itself to some future work. I know Dr. Buer even Chris is a potential candidate for doing something with this, and I hope this talk will kind of jumpstart that. Uh, anyway, I think that, com yeah, that concludes my talk. I'll uh, take any questions. You have three minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> yes. Uh, two questions. First, uh, I didn't quite get why you ignored the small scale training, and why we cannot ignore the small scale training, training effect in coverage for our tunnel residents. Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. So we ignore it because there's an understanding that localization signals are averaged or integrated over a long period of time. So the small scale fading, so shadowing is fading, uh, shadowing changes, but not very quickly. Now the small scale fading uh, is rapid fluctuations, positive and negative fluctuations in received signal strength. And so the assumption is that when we integrate over long periods of time, these rapid sums of positive and negative fluctuations are averaged out. And why do you need to integrate over long periods of time? Be uh, to, for processing gain, because, for example, for communications, you only need to be able to receive the signal from your uh, serving base station. But for positioning, you need to receive signals from really far away base stations, typically. Which means that there's definitely interferes that are actually much stronger than the signal that you're looking at. So for example, you, we might assign each base station a different pseudo-random sequence, like a CDMA system, right? And then the receiver would know that sequence and then integrate out for each different base station. But typically, that integration needs to be over a long period of time to provide a lot of processing gain. And in the GDOP analysis, you consider the maximum angle separation between Basis stations, right? Yes. I'm wondering what if you consider the minimum separation angle between basis stations? 
Um, Do you think it's more useful or the minimum? It, I mean, it would be useful, right? Because if 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 two base stations are right next to each other, then they pretty much don't provide any new information. They might as well be one. So I mean, really, ideally, you would want to characterize maybe both the maximum and the minimum to give you an idea of okay, what's the maximum neglected arc, right? Because you you need to know. Is this whole side neglected, which is what the maximum would tell you? But the minimum uh, could tell you, essentially, if there's duplicates, right? Duplication of information. So I, mean, I haven't looked at it. Chris, mark it down. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that could be looked at. Yes? Chris, I want to say congratulations. Oh, thanks. And then I got a question. How does it know? I mean, well, I mean, there. I actually didn't, don't really look exactly into how it's done, but that could be part of a. Um, I think so. For example, for GPS, I believe the whatever they call it, ephemeris, whatever it's called, ephemeris. Uh, the location of essentially the anchor is it could be part of the transmission of the signal that's coming from that anchor. But I mean, obviously, at some point, uh, the cellular network operator must know where the base stations are. Like, for example, there's you know GPS, or I mean, they place the base stations. So I mean, in any localization system, there's always going to be reference devices, and you can use different techniques to know the locations of those reference devices. But you can't calculate a position using reference devices if you don't know where they are. Now, how it's actually done in cellular networks or LTE, I would imagine that there is, as part of the transmission, the base station provides location information, its own location information. If anybody else knows exactly. It provides an ID, and then the operator knows. It's from some database. Yeah. OK. I got another question. What is the impact of this L for the number of the base stations on the Okay, so yes. So typically, the more the better, and you know, it's almost like I planted you, <laughs> because, but I didn't. <laughs> I have a slide that uh, kind of shows hearability and localization performance. Uh, this is specifically so hearability. The, essentially, how many base stations can participate has been cited in the three GPP standardization documentation as a limiting factor in meeting these FCC E nine one one requirements, and. Here I have a figure where I plot positioning error. This is positioning error over many, many different simulations. Uh, and this is a CDF. So, right, so what's the probability of a position that the positioning error is less than whatever's on the x-axis for different minimum values of L. So if if I, for example, could guarantee that a mobile device always has at least one or more base stations, then I could you know, then I would be on this curve and say, oh, positioning performance would, you know, would fall on this curve. If I could guarantee two or more, it gets better. Three or more, four or more, five or more, six or more. But you see overall, right, more base stations, it's better. You get better performance. And then in this figure also, these dashed lines show, are there to represent this FCC E911 mandate. So the FCC E911 mandate, at least for outdoors right now, says that mobile phones must be located within 50 meters 67% of the time, within 150 meters 90% of the time. And so in order you know, for one of these curves to meet the FCC requirements, it has to go across through both horizontal dashed lines. That's, that's what, so in this case, I could see that so I could, in theory, tell the cellular network operator, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. I could, in theory, as a cellular network operator, say, if I can guarantee that I can use six base stations for localization, at a minimum of six, then I know that I can meet these FCC requirements. Is there a possible question that if I, if I am a user in the network, uh, Right. I guess I did that great. Then the spread closes will be four months. Right? So if I 
the three strongest, but yes. So, if that increase is the net gain of the maximum can, does that always guarantee me the larger error is due to the better condition? No, 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 right? No. I mean, because you can have three that are, you know, kind of perfectly at 120 degrees from each other, or four that are almost at the same location. You know, and, and, and the three that are kind of uniformly surrounded is, is almost certainly going to be better than the, the four. However, this is kind of, the, the, for example, in this figure, these requirements, for example, the FCC doesn't care if sometimes you can't locate the device at all, as long as that doesn't happen very often. Does that make sense? So 10% of the time, you could never, you could, not, you could, in theory, not find the mobile device, as long as 90% of the time you find it within 150 meters. So, so yeah, there's always going to be times when something like the geometry is terrible. But we can definitely say that, in general, more base stations. So generally, more base stations gives you generally better positioning performance. That's all we can say. We can't guarantee more. You know, you have four here, you had three here. This will definitely be better than that. No. Unless you had three and now you have four, which used those original three. You had one. In theory, that, then you could do it. <laughs> yeah. Did I click something? No, no, the meeting automatically hangs up. The room is telling us to get out. <laughs> but yeah, so those are really good questions. Yes. Whatever they broadcast to you, it's, it's going to be only in their familiar positions, right? But what we need is the uh, relative position. With respect to the mobile device, we need the position of the position. Uh, you're you know, saying. Compute the performance metric. You're saying, okay. You're saying the base state. I mean, okay, so you're saying in any given positioning scenario, the base station transmits its. Absolute position. Like absolute position. Right. Uh, but in order to compute this performance metric, either the GDOP or the, the new performance metric, uh, the angle, it is computed with respect to the uh, user position, mobile device position, right. the angle. So hence, unless we know the uh, device position, we can't come up uh, with the right. Right. Uh, measure that. Right. I mean, yeah. Like, for example, the CRLV is conditioned on the true. The, like, for example, the CRLV of a particular estimator that's estimating a particular parameter. To calculate the CRLV, you condition on the true right parameter. And the same is true for the, the GDOM, since it's calculated similarly. So what are you saying? I mean, we're not calculating these metrics like on the fly or anything. Does that make sense? Because you can't. Right? Because to calculate them, this is like, we're looking at how do, um, for, we're averaging over all possible positioning scenarios that a mobile device might encounter over a cellular network. And we want to see... How do different changing, for example, the density of the base stations, how does that affect these metrics? But we're not, you're not using the metrics like on the fly to determine, for example, in theory, right? I, I've seen papers that propose using the GDOT to determine which base stations to use. Th those don't make any sense, really. I mean, you know, unless you have a really good idea already of where you are. But yeah, no, so that's a flaw that I've seen kind of in a bunch of different papers. But yeah, that's not what we're trying to propose here. Yes. Um, going back to your, your metric for the rotation at an angle. Yeah. Um, did you consider at all using like the, the mean of the angle? It, it, it just seems to me like so the best possible scenario, my understanding would be if they were equally spaced, right? So so if you looked at like the geometric mean of the angle, right, that right. would be maximized. Right. Your, um, yeah. So I, I can actually speak to that, but you did you have I want to answer the uh, metric question. So Can I? instead of looking at the mean, okay. we actually look at the sum of the log. It's sort of as proportional fairness. We're trying to equalize the angle as if giving resources equally to all the angles. So it has a very nice relationship with, with uh, uh, proportional fairness. But the main reason we did not look at these is because Javier wanted to graduate. Yeah. So <laughs> 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 one of our audience, uh, we talked about this uh, sum of log, we talked about the min, that Mohammed asked before. And the sum of squares. And sum of the squares, and uh, there are some optimality relations of the sum of the squares the that we found. Uh, there is this whole area called uh, a random, randomly doubled graph, which actually look, it looks at uh, these problems, and it's actually a fairly old problem that we looked at for 
more than my third year is now. Uh, it's just that Tommy is just one people. And well, and actually, and actually, I did, I did actually look at so. This I did. The, you know, obviously, optimality is defined according to some criteria. But if you use something called Pittman relative efficiency, uh, which is some optimality criteria, and to your point, you're saying right, you you want these mo these base stations to be kind of uh, uniformly spread around. There is a whole paper that shows that the sum of the squares is optimal according to that criteria. Um, then the paper also goes on to essentially show that you cannot characterize that at all. The, even the sum of the logs, uh, there's another paper, uh, because the, author, the, author, the same author did both and actually thought the kind of the propor proportional fair scheduling type approach, the sum of the logs, which, is, which I see is related to kind of entropy and uh, information theory kind of concepts. I thought that would be better. And the author even was surprised that it wasn't. But even in all those cases, um, the goal was to characterize these metrics, and they never could. The only thing they could ever do was look at it in the, what they, in the asymptotic case. And then essentially, asymptotically, all of these metrics turn into Gaussians, and then they're trying to find the mean and the variance, which doesn't give you that much insight when you have four or five base stations as opposed to infinite number. So yeah, so people have looked at it. I looked at it, and, and obviously, and I'm wanting to graduate. And this one, this one, <laughs> this one worked out really nicely. All right, let's thank the speaker again. I see Yaman is here. Let's congratulate him again. <laughs>